I'm sure a lot of us know of the hit TV show, The Honeymooners, right? It was a show about a bus driver and his wife and a garbage man and his wife and the two couples live together in the same building. The last cast member of that uh, show passed away this year. And that was Trixie, Ed's wife. That's the actress Joyce Randolph. So she was the last cast member of the four. She passed away this year. You know that show only ran for one year. Yeah, it ran from 1955 to 1956, and they only did 39 episodes. Well, of course, Ed was not her real husband. <laughs> the actress, Joyce Randolph, uh, her husband was named Richard, and he died back in 1997. So think about that. That was 23 years ago. That is a long time to live without the person that you love. This June uh, will be my 13th year as pastor of this church. And in the 13 years that I have been here, I have presided over 50 funerals. The most recent one was just this last Saturday. The poet Shelley wrote, ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. In other words, death affects us all. Grief is painful. And it is something that we all know all too well. That's why two of our ministries, both Grief Share and Stephen's ministry, are so important. But there's another form of grief, right? You could simply have a broken marriage. That can cause deep sadness. Others uh, could be fired from their job. That could also be a horrible experience. In your life, grief will come in many forms. But I think the most difficult one, of course, is the loss of a loved one. And it doesn't matter if it was sudden or if it was long and drawn out. Somebody once said, grief is the price we pay for loving. Today is the last of our signs from the book of John. And I bet we all thought that it would be the cross, right? It's gotta be the resurrection. Surely Jesus rising from the dead, that would be the last sign, but it's not. Today we're looking at the resurrection of Lazarus that's found in John chapter 11. It says, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village and was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you lain him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Lazarus, as the story points out, is friend to Jesus and brother to Mary and Martha. And this story only appears in the book of John. A messenger shows up where Jesus is ministering and requests Jesus immediately come to the home of this sick man. Lazarus lived in a nearby town, Bethany, about two miles southeast of Jerusalem. Jesus had previously visited the three siblings. He often enjoyed their family hospitality. The Bible records his sister, Mary, would sit at the master's feet and listen to his words. Martha, Mary's sister, she's the one that complained to Jesus that she needed help in the kitchen. After this story, Lazarus is mentioned only one more time in the gospel uh, in chapter 12, six days before the Passover when Jesus is crucified. Jesus returns to Bethany and Lazarus attends a supper that Martha, his sister, serves. The people then see Lazarus and Jesus together and that attracts a lot of attention. And then the author notes that the chief priests then consider having Lazarus killed because so many people saw them and believed in Jesus because of this story. And it's a fascinating story, and there's certainly a lot here to notice. But first, I would just uh, go back and recap the reality of grief, right? The reality of grief. My dad once started to have a conversation with me, and he started by saying, David, if I die, and I stopped him, and I said, Dad, you mean when? you die, when you die. It's not if, everybody dies. Benjamin Franklin said there are only two things that you can be sure of in life, death and taxes. John, James 4.14 says, you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And if death is something that comes to all, then so does grief. Psychologists have come up with five different stages of grief that either we go through all of them or we go through some of them. The first one is typically denial. You feel numb in those early days of grief. Some people at first, they'll even carry on as if nothing had happened. Even if we know in our heads that someone has died, it's hard to believe that that person's never coming back. It's also very common to feel the presence of them still, to hear their voice or to see them. And then comes anger. Anger is a completely natural emotion, and it's equally natural when someone dies. Death can seem cruel, it can seem unfair, especially when someone has died ahead of you or someone has died before you had plans together. It's also common to feel angry toward the person who has died. They've left you. or angry at ourselves because of something that we did or didn't do. And then 
The next stage is bargaining. When we're in pain, it's sometimes hard to accept that there's nothing we can do about it. Bargaining is when we start to make deals with ourself or deals with God. We want to believe that if we act in a particular way or do something, it'll make us feel better. It's also common to find ourselves going over things over and over and over again in the past and asking ourselves what if questions. What if we had done something differently? Could we go back? Could we change something and make it turn out differently? And then depression, sadness, grief. The pain is very intense and it comes in waves and waves over months of time. Life can feel like it doesn't hold that same spark that it once had, and it could even feel scary. Some people experience all of these stages, some only a handful of them, but as we'll see from our story, grief is not best handled alone. In our text, Mary and Martha and Jesus share, and they support one another in their grief. And I can't tell if this is anger or bargaining, but clearly we see the sisters of Lazarus hurting. And we also see that Jesus understands our grief. You know, one of the things that makes this story so unique is that we get a picture of Jesus grieving. Jesus is a close personal friend of Lazarus and his two sisters. They have a home in Bethany just outside Jerusalem. Jesus stays at their house often. They have times of friendship together. These are the people that he hangs out with. These are the people that he has downtime with. Which, which could be sharing a meal together, and I'm, I'm sure they would sit around the table and have laughs. Jesus is in another town when he hears that Lazarus is sick and comes to him, and like anyone who receives news, Jesus is concerned, but not concerned enough to go. In fact, Jesus takes this opportunity to make this prophetic statement to the people around him. He says, this sickness does not lead to death, but it is for the glory of God which if we remember is pretty much the same thing he said when first asked about the man born blind, right? In that story, the disciples asked the question. You know, when tragedy strikes, we ask the question, why did this have to happen? The disciples ask, why is this man born blind? Did his parents sin or is he being punished? And Jesus said, it's not either of those things. Instead, Jesus says, this is for the glory of God. It's as if Jesus has another larger plan in mind. Beyond the boundaries of just one man's death, Jesus then actually delays his arrival into Bethany. It's only after we understand that Lazarus has died that Jesus prepares to travel. But taken from the perspective of the sisters, Jesus is late and possibly even negligent in their eyes. And I think Mary and Martha have every right to be angry. We can see Martha running toward Jesus. Mary's still in the house grieving. And she's crying out, Lord, if you had only been here, he would still be alive. How do you hear that tone of voice in your own head? Do you just hear it as a polite statement? I have a little trouble with something that would sound more polite and calm in her voice. I think Martha who seems a little bit more aggressive anyway, is running toward Jesus and pounding on his chest. Why weren't you here? You could have saved him. This reminds me of Jesus walking on the water. You know, the disciples alone in the boat, waves crashing all around them, fearing that they might drown and wondering, where is God? Where is God in the storm? Where is God when it hurts? Martha is here expressing her grief to Jesus holding him responsible. And her words are really, right? They really are words too, because we have all felt just like her. You've prayed that prayer. Lord, why weren't you there? If you had only been here. Have you ever lamented in the valley of the shadow of death? Lord, if you'd only been here, why weren't you in my storm? Where were you? when I needed you. We find ourselves in a hospital room, holding a hand as life is slipping away and we offer a prayer, Lord, come through for me right now. Do a miracle just like you've done in the Bible and, and nothing happens. 
and you're left with this question in your heart, why wasn't the Lord there? Why? Why didn't he heal my loved one? Why wasn't he there for me when I needed him the most? And that's a fair question. And it's an okay question to ask. Some of us get stuck on that question and we never get over it. Some of us blame God. And grief ends up driving a wedge between us and God. And we think, he doesn't care. He doesn't understand. After all, he has the power to heal. He's done it before, but he doesn't do it for me. And listen, if you've felt that, thought that, don't be ashamed. Here we see Martha, one of Jesus' best friends, ask him the very same question. Don't be ashamed. Jesus can take it. In fact, getting those emotions out is better than burying them, living with disappointment, and not dealing with it. Because the opposite is, if we bury that grief and we leave it unresolved, it'll show itself in our attitudes, in our words, and in our relationship with God. We can come to God with our grief instead of pushing him away. We need to learn to deal with grief in a healthy way and to first realize that Jesus shares our grief. John 11 says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And the Jew said, see how he loved him. What do you see in that picture? You see Jesus crying for loss. Even though within minutes he is going to raise Lazarus, but seeing the pain of death in the eyes of his friends, that made him cry. Jesus weeps with us. When you are at that hospital bedside, don't think for a moment that Jesus is not there. It might feel like he's not there, but he is. And if he's not doing anything else, he is there weeping with you and for you. But this is not the end of the story because we also see that Jesus brings hope. George Mueller said, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. Faith begins where our power ends. Now we want to ask the question, what is going on in this passage beneath the surface? Right? Because the title is, Jesus Raises Lazarus from the Dead. And we know the story. But John isn't interested in telling us stories about Jesus' miracles. John is meticulously showing us the signs that Jesus is the Messiah. John is showing us the signs that Jesus is God. There is a purpose in this death. There is a plan at work here. Many times when a loved one dies, we have a problem of trying to figure out why this happened, right? Why this tragedy? Back in 2015, this community lost the Settlemeyers. It was a family of four. They were killed on 105 coming home from church. This is a picture of my son and his classmates releasing a balloon for his friend Harley, who was six at the time. It was a tragic story. How can that story serve the purposes and eternal plan of God? Or does it? You know, when something like that happens, it makes absolutely no sense at all. But we know there are some deaths that happen when the timing and the circumstances do cause God's name to be glorified. I find it interesting here that Jesus says that God is going to be glorified through this death. But there is a price for it. And the price that has to be paid is grief. And if I stop the story right here, I'm not sure I like that God. A God who does things at our expense for his glory. Is that what Jesus is saying? No, I don't think so. 
Jesus has a bigger plan and he has a bigger purpose in mind. And his love for us is actually so much bigger than we can possibly understand. In our story, Jesus goes to Bethany and Lazarus has been dead four days. And he talks briefly with Mary and Martha. And then Jesus says, where have you buried him? And when Jesus sees the pain on everyone's faces, he cries human tears. But then he gets to work. In that moment, I go all the way back to Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine. You know, there's hopelessness in that story. There's going to be a wedding that's ruined. And Jesus says, no. Not if I have anything to say about it. Not not on my watch. And Jesus rolls up his sleeves and he changes the story. That's what Jesus came to do. Jesus is not the spectator of our lives. He is a participant. And in Luke 4, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to save. Jesus comes to save our wedding as well, yours and mine. He cannot be just a bystander. He does not watch from above. He came to be our beloved. He came to be our hope. He came to be our life and to rescue us from death. So standing at Lazarus' grave, Jesus says to himself, I'm putting this to end once and for all. And he gives the instruction, take away the stone. Martha, as if trying to calm Jesus down, reminds him, Lazarus has been dead for four days. He's starting to decompose. And Jesus says, I told you that you would see the glory of God. And Jesus says to Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he is dead, yet will he live. And he that believes in me will never die. And just like when Jesus fed the 5,000, he says a prayer. And then Jesus commands life over death. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. He who has the power and authority over life and death merely speaks and it is done. Just like when Jesus told the official that his son would live. The one who is creator speaks and creation listens. And then into this grief-filled day at Bethany, Jesus gives us a preview of our own resurrection and the resurrection of all who die in Christ. Lazarus come forth and then Lazarus emerges from the tomb. And Jesus has one more command. Unbind him and let him go. Dead legs can now walk again. Just like when Jesus healed the paralyzed man at the pool. In fact, if you were going to take all seven of these signs from the book of John, and you could see a picture painted of a Savior who came to end all grief and weeping, a Savior who understands that aching sense of loss and loneliness, and a rescuer who speak to us. He speaks to us of resurrection. He speaks to us of hope. Those things, they are only found in him. And as the curtain comes down on these seven stories, we hear Jesus repeat for us the good news. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. That's the gospel. That is the hope. That is the light at the end of all pain and all grief. There is a resurrection life for you. And there is a hope for you. For all who follow Jesus, 
Yes, there will be pain in this life, and grief is the price that we pay for loving, but Jesus offers us resurrection, and he offers us hope. Death always makes a huge change in our life. But when we have Jesus at the center, we can go forward. Grief will test our faith. It'll give us a time of struggle. It might even push us a little bit away from God and we don't feel like talking to him, but keep turning back to him because he is the resurrection. He is the life. I know that some of you are still grieving. Even now, for someone in your life, and like I said, grief is painful, even for people who know Christ. But let's remember that Jesus weeps with us. Even if it seems like he hasn't done anything else, he shares our pain and he grieves with us. Here at Walden Church, I mentioned that we have a couple of ministries. We have Grief Share and we have Stephen's Ministry. Now, Grief Share is something that runs quarterly. It runs during some of our seasons and it runs for a, a time and then stops. And so that is a group session where you will all get together as, as a group and share your experiences, share your uh, feelings. And there's a moderator, there's a video. It's something that you can do as a community. But we also have Stevens Ministers, and that's one-on-one. -on -one. And that is something we offer year-round. So if you would like to speak to a Stevens Minister, and again, they're just, they're just a, a neighbor, just like you. They're a neighbor, just like you. They're not a pastor. They, they don't, there's no judgment for anything. There's just simply a person who has been trained to listen someone who has been trained to help you walk through your emotions and the things that you're struggling with, you can simply just call the church office and ask to be assigned to a Stevens minister. And you can come back as often as you need. Or if you'd like, you can just email the church office. You can go to our website, which is waldenchurch.com. You can email our church office and receive more information about Stevens ministry. And we have both of those ministries available to anyone uh, who lives within driving distance. And we wanna be uh, the church that serves our community. And we wanna be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.